How's it going, Giants fans? Welcome back to Fireside Giants with your boys, Alex and Anthony. Today, we have an interesting discussion we want to have, and we want you guys to be a part of it. So if you're interested, leave a comment in the YouTube section, and uh, we'll have a good conversation about kind of what's going on with the Giants coordinators right now. Both of them are interviewing for vacant head coaching positions. Mike Kafka's interviewed specifically for three of the five vacancies, and he's also interviewed for the Houston Texans twice already. So there's legitimate interest in Mike Kafka. Um, Anthony and I want to kind of have a discussion, like an open discussion about what Mike Kafka meant to this team this past season, what Wink Martindale meant to this team this past season, how the system's kind of developed, how things are going for this Giants team, the value of both guys, who we'd prefer if the Giants were going to lose one of them, who was the easier to replace. Um, I think it's kind of a fluid conversation because we know Brian Dable's an offensive head coach. We know that he had a lot to say in the offensive system and how they built around Saquon, how they built around Daniel Jones and the weaknesses and strengths on this roster. Uh, but then you have Mike Kafka who actually implemented it, actually was calling the plays, you know, d utilizing the, the flow of the game. Um, there's a lot of, you know, collaboration between those two guys. And Daniel Jones losing a coordinator after another season is just annoying, I guess to say the least. Like every year, every two years, it's like constantly turnover at the coordinator position. Um, and ultimately we prefer to not lose either of these two guys, but at the end of the day, this is the NFL and good coaches end up going, they end up going and getting better opportunities and better jobs. And, um, generally I, if I'm a, if I'm a, another team, I'm not hiring a first year offensive coordinator to a head coaching job, but Kafka might be different. You know, he's coming from some of the best organizations in the game. He, now he has experience behind, you know, Andy Reid in this chiefs organization. Now he has experience with Brian Dable and the kind of a, a bills spinoff and, this is exactly where you want to be if you're Kafka, learning from some of the best that are executing at the highest level, getting the most out of players who otherwise should not be playing um, on a starting team. And it's pretty impressive to see what they've done, Anthony. But you know, before we dive into having kind of this discussion and just talking about how the coordinators like, stack up against each other and the value of both, how do you do today, my friend? I'm doing great. I think it's interesting news to see Mike Kafka getting a second head coaching interview with the Houston Texans. And the fact that he's being considered for so many of the open positions is also really interesting to me. Now, I think that Wink Martindale is a guy who, you know, he's going to get the same looks. He's going to get interviews and recognition for head coaching jobs. But that's not as surprising. He's been a defensive coordinator for many years. In fact, the Giants interviewed him for their head coaching position back in, I believe it was 2020. So he's already had, he's already been in this position before where he's established himself as a proven defensive coordinator and now teams are looking at can he make the jump to head coach but for Mike Kafka to be making this jump so early in his career as a coordinator it's pretty surprising one year as an offensive coordinator before that he was just a quarterbacks coach with the Kansas City Chiefs but then again he was the quarterbacks coach for the Kansas City Chiefs who have the best quarterback in the NFL so that right there gave him some notoriety which helped him get the job with the Giants as OC and now after one successful year turning uh, Daniel Jones into a franchise quarterback overnight in collaboration with Brian Dable, I mean, it's a good look for Mike Kafka. But for me, I think that it is too soon for Mike Kafka. I, I'm not sure how confident I would be in him as a head coach because, to be completely honest, I have my question marks about him as an offensive coordinator. I think that there were certain things in his game plans that weren't perfect and he needs to improve on. And I think that another year as an OC would help him improve upon those things. And some of those things that I'll mention are getting away from the running game too soon, not even incorporating the running game into a game plan. Some of those third down decisions that we had mid-season that were making us scratch our heads. So it wasn't a perfect year for Mike Kafka. And it's not like he burst onto the scene as easily the best OC in the NFL. No, I think that he was good and improved week by week and has some potential to be a great offensive coordinator. But that's why when you look at him, He's, to me, a guy who has potential to be a great OC. I don't know what his potential is as a head coach just yet because he hasn't realized his potential as an OC. So I'm very surprised to see that he's getting such significant interest around the league at that head coaching spot. But Wink Martindale versus Mike Kafka, if you have to decide who is more valuable, Alex, I'm going to go ahead and say that it is Wink Martindale. But the catch to that is exactly what you mentioned. Do we really want to see Daniel Jones get coached by another OC next season? I don't know. Yeah, so... Kind of how I would go about this is like you look at what Mike Kafka brought to this offense, and I wrote an article this morning about how the Giants may lose their offensive coordinator after you know one year of having him. Um, we know Brian Dable's an offense first coach, and a lot of teams are going in that direction, which is why probably he's getting more interest. Which is actually crazy, by the way. Why is Mike Kafka getting more head coaching interest right now than Wink Martindale? You know what I mean? 
and it kind of plays into what we said the other day. Offensive coaches are getting the preference these days. And and Wink already said he has no – this is not a stepping stone for him. He doesn't see the Giants' job as a way to elevate himself and promote himself into a head coaching role. He's like, I love New York City, best city in the world. I love this team. I've always wanted to be with the Giants, and this is my opportunity to, to build something special here, which I find to be really commendable personally, and that's – and heroic in a way because of the way this defense performed, especially you know top five in red zone defense um, after losing so many key pieces and injuries just impacting this team all year long. Wink Martindale has a very specific style. If they manage to hold on to him and keep him, they will be able to build on that style. They'll be able to add the cornerbacks they need to play heavy man coverage. They're going to get a Dory Jackson back, and hopefully we never use him as a freaking punt returner again. Um, but, you know, end of the day, you add a CB2 that really fits the mold. They view Cordell Flott as a long-term solution on this team. I don't think he's going to be starting anytime soon. Uh, but I do think he's a nice developmental piece with his frame and size. Um, he's got to add a little bit more weight. Got to get a little bit more experience and stay healthy. Got banged up a couple times this year and missed time. Um, you got Xavier McKinney. He's a building block. Joe Shane believes that. Brian Dable believes that. Wink Martindale believes that. Um, they have key pieces. You know, Aziz Ojolari healthy is a tremendous pass rusher. Kayvon Thibodeau, they view as a future superstar. Dexter Lawrence is a superstar. Leonard Williams is a star. You know, they have a lot of really great pieces. You add a athletic linebacker. You look with the, you know, Baltimore, the linebackers that they had over the years. You know, C.J. Mosley, unbelievable talent until he left. He was one of the best linebackers, if not the best in football as a coverage and run stopper. You look at even Patrick Queen, really athletic. He's not the best linebacker in the world, but he fits Wake Martindale's mold pretty well, and he can fill the gaps. Um, so, you know, I would not be surprised the Giants go out, focus on getting a CB2, focus on getting a linebacker, and really improve this defense and help Wink Martindale build out a really strong unit. And then on the other side of the football, you got Wink Martindale, or rather uh, Mike Kafka. So the thing about the uh, NFL these days is it seems to me that they're really investing in former quarterbacks. Mike Kafka was a former fourth-round pick from the Philadelphia Eagles. Look at Kellen Moore and the Dallas Cowboys. You know, Kellen Moore's getting um, head coaching kind of talks as well. A lot of these former quarterbacks are becoming coordinators, and the really smart ones, at least. Like, the next guy up in line, some people are saying Kyle Lauletta. You know, he's with the, the Eagles right now, and he's on their offensive staff, and he apparently is a stud. You know, obviously, um, where did he go to school again? Dartmouth? I believe he went to Dartmouth, maybe? I don't remember. I do not Spiders remember where Kyle Lalletta went, to be honest. <laughs> I feel like he was into Dartmouth, but I might be mistaken there. You guys might remember. Uh, but, you know, when you're, when you're looking at this, Anthony, wh what are you thinking about, you know, building this defense? I think my, uh, if we're going to have this conversation right now, who would you be more willing to lose, you know, if, if, if one of them had to leave? If I'm more willing to lose one, I'm more willing to lose Mike Kafka. And the reason why is because when you look at Brian Dable – there was a conversation going into the season as to who would be calling the plays. There was a conversation, would it be Brian Dable calling the plays or would it be Mike Kafka? And a lot of fans even wanted it to be Brian Dable. You know, there were some fans who were like, no, we don't want too much on his plate. And that'll be the same argument going into this upcoming season if Mike Kafka were to leave. So the conversation might just have to be had again. Is Brian Dable going to call plays or find another offensive coordinator to call plays again? And honestly, if he loses Mike Kafka, you could just say that Brian Dable, being the amazing offensive mind that he is, could serve as both HC and OC. It's not unheard of to see a coach be the head coach and the offensive coordinator or the head coach of the defensive right. coordinator for that matter. So I could see Brian Dable going out there, serving both roles, calling plays, and continuing to develop Daniel Jones the same way that Mike Kafka was this past season. I don't think that it's something that would actually damn the team in any way because Brian Dable is a guy that I completely trust, and I think that he is an amazing coach, up and coming, and I think that he's going to establish himself as one of the best coaches in the NFL. And if he has to call plays on Sundays as well, I think it's something that he could personally handle. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing, though, is that I think that what makes Brian Dable so great is because of how attentive he is to the individuals, right? If you ask him to become your coordinator on top of being the head coach, it may pull him in different directions where he can't impact the game in game with on like a personal level with these individual players. He's going to be so busy calling plays, running uh, time management. You know, like there's so many different variables that are now you know taking him away from his responsibilities this year. And I think that those moments, but for what it's worth, those moments when he goes over to Darius Slayton and he's like, keep your head up. When he goes over to a defensive player on the bench and says, you know, we need this from you. We may not see that as much because he's now calling offensive plays. He's got to be hyper-focused on the next drive, the current drive. You know, I, I'm, I'm not saying that he won't do a phenomenal job and he can't handle it. What I'm saying is he was so good this year doing all of the things that, 
Joe Judge and Shermer didn't do in the past and really just being personable and really going and, and elevating everybody um, on the sideline that I don't know if, if that plays a big factor in how the team succeeds in the future. I would prefer that, you know, he builds out the playbook and he's in lockstep with whoever's calling the plays. Like, I think him and Kafka are always in, in like, coordinating. They were always in communication with one another sure. via the headset. And I think that was a really good blend because Dable could throw his, throw his influence in there but also maintain what he was doing on the sideline. And I guarantee every single thing he was doing on that sideline was orchestrated and strategic to make sure that everyone was playing to the best of their abilities. If you lose that variable – you know, maybe it impacts things. Like, it, maybe it doesn't. Maybe it doesn't matter at all. Maybe he just, you know, it goes whatever. But a lot of teams are having a lot of success right now with their offensive coordinators being up above in the booth. You know, Dable's not going to be that guy. He's got to yeah. be on the field. So, you know, you had all those assistants. If you ever see the shots in the, of them in the booth, they have four or five assistants in there, all crunching numbers, all doing things mm -hmm. to make sure, like, this is the right play. That's the right play. Dable can't do that. You know, he's got to be communicating with other people in a booth, and then he's got to be, you know, attentive to the players and you know, maybe you need an offensive coordinator this time, this day and age, especially when you're running a team at this high of a level and Dable's such a personable guy, the type of coach he is. You know, what are your thoughts on that? I agree with you. I wasn't trying to advocate for Brian Dable calling plays. If Mike Kafka right. were to leave, I do not prefer to see Brian Dable take over as the OC. I'm saying worst case scenario, he has the ability to do it. So it's less of a loss to lose Mike Kafka than it is Wink Martindale. Because if, if you lose Wink Martindale, you have to find a new defensive coordinator that can replicate his success. But if you lose Mike Kafka, you still have Brian Dable who can take over the play calling duties if need be. However, I would not prefer to see him do that because of all the things that you just mentioned, Alex. I would prefer to see him continue to be that overseeing head coach, making those connections on the sideline, continuing to strategize in, co in collaboration with the DC, OC, and all of the other assistants on the staff. But Here's another reason why I'm okay with Mike Kafka leaving as opposed to Wink Martindale. And it's because Brian Dable, I mean, when you look at his staff this season, he pretty much knocked every hiring out of the park. He was amazing. Yep. And he cast a very wide net. He hired an OC that he had zero connections to, a DC as well. Both of those guys he had no connections to. You know, he didn't know them. But he interviewed them, and then he he uh, he determined that they were the best coordinators for that position. And so he went and hired them. And I think that... If we were to be in this position again one year later, I trust in Brian Dable to go out there, cast that wide net, and find another OC who can get the job done. But to your point of having the guy in the sky, right, having the eye in the sky up there with Mike Kafka, I don't think it's necessary for offensive coordinators to be up there. I mean, if you look at the Chiefs, we've talked about uh, Eric Bieniemy before. He's on the sideline with Andy Reid, so, and that's one of the best offenses in the NFL. And I believe... No, the Bills all OC, what's his name? Ken Dorsey, I think it is. He is an eye in the sky. So it, it really goes either way. You know, there's some OCs that succeed better on the sideline because they do the personal one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversations that you're talking about that Brian Dable does. Dable does that because Kafka isn't there. If Kafka, if Kafka was on the sideline, he'd be the one pulling Darius Slayton aside and telling him to keep his head up. So it goes either way. And I think that having the guy in the sky helps, but it's not necessary. But my main thing here is with Brian Dable... In the emergency situation, he can be your OC, he can call your plays, but I really just trust in him to go out there and find a good OC the same way that he did last year because he's a very smart guy, he knows what a good offense looks like, and he knows how to find other great offensive minds to step in here and help him build his scheme. Yeah, I think that's totally fair. Um, I would say what the Chiefs are interesting because Eric Benemy is is kind of labeled the OC, but like Andy Reid calls a lot of the plays too, so he's kind of that head coach. And the, the thing is, Andy Reid has like, 20 years of experience like as a head coach you know i mean not 20 but he's got a decade's worth of experience as a head coach you know what i mean brian able's in year one he knows how to handle every individual player every individual thing the a lot of the players on that roster have been there for a long time and understand exactly what the role is exactly what they're supposed to do and then you have your superstar quarterback and patrick mahomes that can make audibles and change things at the line of scrimmage and he has they have all the confidence in the world in him. You know, installing a new offense with Daniel Jones takes years. You know, it takes time. Um, so my biggest fear, and I would prefer to keep Wink Martindale, as, as kind of you mentioned before, because Brian Dable is the offensive head coach. But my biggest fear about losing Mike Kafka, and a lot of people on Twitter are like, I don't think Mike Kafka is that valuable. You know, he was inconsistent and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, do people not realize we had no receivers this season? Like, do you guys, do, do people not realize that Darius Slayton, Isaiah Hodges coming on midway and Richie James are is like the worst by a pretty significant margin, the worst receiving core in football. You know what I mean? Like 
these guys, the fact that we got so much production out of them is borderline unimaginable. We had the sixth ranked red zone conversion rate in football after going the 32nd ranked football, uh, uh, you know, ranked football uh, red zone conversion rate in 2022, 2021 rather, sorry, with Garrett, with Garrett as, a, as our OC. Going from 32 to sixth ranked is insane. Who was calling those plays? Mike Kafka. The guy is a stud. The guy is going to get better. It was his first year as an offensive coordinator. His, him being a lops, lockstep with Brian Dable is a really good thing. People are underselling and undervaluing how great Mike Kafka was, especially late in the season. His game plans against the Colts and against the Minnesota Vikings were pure genius, along with Brian Dable. I'm sure he had a big say in it too. So those two guys came up with genius game plan. Mike Kafka actually executed it, and the players did it on the field. So I'll tell you this right now, though. Eagles, the game plan, they looked all out of whack. They looked all out of sorts. And, and I, I simply don't think it was because the Giants didn't prepare. I think it was because the Eagles were just that much better. You know, they were just so freaking good. And when you don't have legitimate receivers, like wide receiver ones like Jamar Chase, like C.D. Lamb, like any of those top guys in the league that can get open on their own and do things – um, and make just those those acrobatic catches, you know, they're going to block you up, man. The, the, the Eagles didn't respect our receiving core, and it showed because they kicked our ass, man. Hodges had three yards on, like, one reception. Um, they locked him down, and, and they did it on purpose, and they, and they did it because they have the talent to do so. We don't have those type of guys that are going to destroy, you know, James Bradbury or or any of the, or Darius Slay in coverage or, you know, Gardner Johnson, like, we, we have a lack of talent there, and the fact that we were as good as we were um, is mind-blowing. The Giants were dead average. They were average. They ranked 16th this year in points per game. That's a very good comparably to what we had last year. You know what I mean? We took a 100% leap, basically, in terms of – or maybe a 50% leap getting to average. 100% would have been all the way to like the top in the league. But going from bottom three to 16th, means that we're heading in the right direction. You add more guys to this unit, you add more guys to this equation, it should theoretically get better. Losing my Kafka is going to hurt Daniel Jones because Daniel Jones now knows what to expect. He knows what type of plays he likes to call. He knows that he can trust him. He knows what type of wrinkles he likes to add in. You know, And Dable won't, I don't think they'll miss a beat, but there, ha there is something to be said about just consistently losing coordinators that impacts Daniel Jones in this offense. You know what I mean? I would prefer them not to have to go through this because then Brian Dable has to now tr has to learn how to trust a new offensive coordinator. He has to learn how to work uh, with a new guy once again. Again, I don't think Mike Kafka is going to get a head coaching job mainly because he's just too raw. But if they do lose him, I think that it's a, it's a big loss, and I think that we will feel that loss at least in the beginning of the season. Um, what are your thoughts about that? You know, if because I know a lot of people are kind of undervaluing Kafka right now, like because Brian Dable, I think you know, made the playbook, made the offense. I don't want to leave Kafka out of this equation and not give him the credit he deserves. I do think that he was very good. And, and while our offense wasn't where it needed to be, we ranked average without a lot of our star players from the, that we've had in the past. You know what I mean? So we didn't really even use Kenny Galladay, and he was supposed to be a big piece for us. And, like, that's – I mean, that should tell you everything you need to know about how the Giants really rolled with nothing and got so much value out of everybody. Yeah, I'm going to get a little crazy here and play a little bit of devil's advocate. So let's say that Mike Kafka leaves and goes to a team like the Texans or the Panthers. You know, they have quarterback openings, right? And Daniel Jones is about to be a free agent. So what if we throw that wrinkle into this whole thing? Daniel Jones says, I don't want a new offensive coordinator. I'm going to go follow Mike Kafka. Now, I don't think that would ever happen because I think that Daniel Jones is going to prioritize being with Brian Dable over being with Mike Kafka. But it's just something to think about because when we're talking about uh, how many different offensive coordinators Daniel Jones has had to start his career, he's already had three, right? Jason Garrett, Pat Shermer, those guys weren't very good. But now they have the, the combo of Brian Dable and Mike Kafka, and that was excellent for Daniel Jones and his development. So I don't know why he would want anyone else. And I think that the Giants need to realize that if they want to keep Daniel Jones and make him their long term starting franchise quarterback, they need to keep Mike Kafka, whether that be extending him now, giving him a pay raise, making him the assistant head coach, whatever the case might be, 
you got to keep Mike Kafka for that very reason. Now, I do think you have to keep Wink Martindale for his own reasons. I think that he is one of the be- one of the best defensive coordinators in football, and that's not even a debate because he has been for years and years and years. But when you're looking at it, Mike Kafka, the development right there with Daniel Jones, you do not need more overturn at that OC position because that has clearly harmed Daniel Jones in the past to go from Shermer to Garrett and then another year of Garrett, but it was a half year of Garrett where he was trying to do different things with, uh, what's his name, the old Browns head coach. Coach Freddie Kitchens, and then now you have Mike Kafka, Brian Dable. They have synergy, right? They collaborate excellently. They work together very well, and Daniel Jones is a better player because those guys are working together. So the last thing you need is to re-sign Daniel Jones to a big-time extension, pay him a boatload of money, and have a new OC come in here, not have that synergy with Daniel Jones, not have that synergy with Brian Dable, and mess up his development once again. So it's very important that Mike Kafka stays in my eyes. Uh, The more that we talk about it, the more important I realize that it is for Daniel Jones. And then if Daniel Jones were to have a new offensive coordinator and not play well because of that, then that just opens up a bunch of of problems, right? That opens up a whole can of worms of possibilities. And if Mike Kafka does get a head coaching job elsewhere, I mean, what stops him from trying to poach Daniel Jones as he's a impending free agent over and saying, hey, I, I got so much more in store for you. Just come over here and let me let me get to work with you. But again, I don't think that would happen. I think that Brian Dable is the important piece here. However, I want to see the consistency, the continuity. I think that Daniel Jones has probably had enough of the overturn at offensive coordinator. So it's got to be a priority for the Giants to make sure that Mike Kafka stays in-house. I mean, dude, Mike Kafka going to Houston, they have the second overall pick. You know, say hello to Bryce Young or CJ Stroud, and Mike Kafka, why would he even need Daniel Jones? He can literally have his pick of the crop Maybe, Maybe he thinks Daniel Jones is better, bro. Maybe Daniel Jones is worth that second money. pick. You never know. I mean, you Listen, I told you I was getting crazy money. and playing devil's advocate here. I'm just I'm just having fun with that one. I, yeah, but no, the, the main that's point is the fact that we can't have more – overturn at offensive coordinator because it'll only harm Daniel Jones. It won't help develop him. And the last right. thing we need is to lock him into a big time contract and watch him get a new OC that doesn't maximize his talents again. Yeah. I mean, look, I feel like it is about Daniel Jones because we know Kafka made this offense better. We know that the communication between him and Dable is positive. The question is, as you kind of mentioned, you kind of alluded to this, which is, which is a big fear of mine. If you bring in another offensive coordinator, You can't fire that person if he struggles to get this offense going with Daniel Jones and a new group um, at the helm. You know what I mean? Um, A new offensive coordinator is probably going to be someone that's never been an OC before because whoever the Giants hire is going to come in knowing this is not my system. You know what I mean? Like I'm not going to be applying my playbook, applying my system. I'm going to be taking over one that already exists. I'm going to be taking over a playbook that is already in place, which is why, in my opinion, it's like if I'm Brian Dable – I'm probably thinking I'm bringing in a creative young mind who is willing to take over what we already have and build wrinkles into it and is a very, very, very good communicator, right? That is the only thing that I'm looking at. Extremely good coordinator and is coming from a, a high a high octane, a potent offense that applies different creative wrinkles that can elevate this system. I'm not bringing in an older veteran OC to come in and try and strong arm Dable into, into changing the system because they think that North Turner's 2004 offense is better than what the Chiefs and Bills are running these days. You know what I mean? I'm bringing in a young mind from maybe the Bengals, from maybe, um, maybe from the Chiefs again, maybe from the Bills, you know, other more potent offenses um, that, that can help this team succeed. Um, and, I, and I think a good communicator, a young creative mind would make sense if they were going to lose Kafka. Um, but right now I think that's really bad. I, it, I hope they keep both of them because right now this team is in a position to keep building and laying the foundational building blocks and really building for the future. And those two coordinators have really set the tone for us. You know, we've seen such drastic growth on both sides of the football. And I think that's really an exciting thing for this, for this giants team that has not really been able to say they've looked into much optimism in the past uh, couple of years. And, I'm really excited about the future. Losing key pieces to that is not in the is not in my deck of cards. A lot of people are like think Kafka's expendable and they can replace him easily and Dable can call the plays. Why would we want to change anything right now? Like we're just coming off one of the best seasons we've had in, in, in decades. You know, maybe more than a decade. So why would we want to change it all up and just take a, a flyer with Dable calling plays? Like it makes no sense to me personally. I really hope we can keep both guys. 
Um, I I'm excited to see what the future is for this team, but I'd love to hear your perspectives below in the YouTube comments about this discussion. You know, kind of talking about Mike Kafka, Wink Marindale. If one was going to leave, who would you prefer? Do you value both of them? Why do you value both of them? Always happy to hear your perspectives. And as always, make sure to like and subscribe as always. And we'll catch you guys on the next Fireside Giants episode. Thank you.